the presentation today, it's the culmination of months of months of hard work of nearly 800 people across all 63 provinces uh, in uh, Vietnam. I have been asked to give a presentation about what are the main findings that we have um, identified from interviewing 13,000 individuals all across Vietnamese um, provinces. Monitoring is an evaluation tool in Vietnam that uniquely answers citizens about their experiences about governance and public administration reform. We have done this on an annual basis for three years in a row now. Uh, in total, it's nearly 50,000 people. It's a huge depository of experiences from different citizens, different backgrounds, different characteristics. Um, in 2013 alone, we interviewed nearly 14,000 citizens. And our respondents' rate is very um, related to the characteristics of the Vietnamese population, very closely to the actual population uh, in Vietnam. We have 47% of men, 53% of women, 85% of kin, and 15% of other ethnic minorities group. And we can continue doing disaggregation by age, by occupation, by um, levels of education. And our sample is highly representative of the overall entire population uh, on Vietnam. And as, as, as was highlighted by Dr. Tao and Dr. Su, it provides an ammunition of data and evidence to support monitoring oversight of different uh, accountability institutions in the country, like the National Assembly, the Fatherland Front, the, the government agencies, and other um, um, agencies to complement other assessments that already exist um, in the country. This is the figure that you have in the cover of the report this year, and this is what it represents. PAPI is not only one number or one indicator. Uh, it's not about naming and shaping provinces on particular scores, but PAPI is the work of a culmination of different dimensions that work together that tries to enhance the living conditions of Vietnamese citizens. We have six dimensions um, that goes from issues of participation at local levels, to public service delivery. And under each one of these dimensions, we also have four specific um, sub-dimensions. In total, we have 22 sub-dimensions. Now, these sub-dimensions are also the product or the aggregation of specific indicators, specific questions that goes um, into the survey. In total, we have 92 of them. When we put all that information together, is a wide range of information that, that can be tailored to according to different needs and different sectors, from education to health to anti-corruption to service delivery to participation um, issues. Who is using PAPI before I give you uh, the data? Very quickly. Right? Uh, in, from the time that we launched PAPI the first time, we have information that more than 22 provinces have actually already used the data in one way or another that have issued an action plan, have issued a resolution. After having looked thoroughly to the different indicators that were provided to that particular uh, provinces. In 2013, nine provinces issued a specific proposals. And when we put all that information together, that what we have is that these provinces uh, uh, put grouped together around 23 million Vietnamese um, citizens. 15 provinces have been understanding the drivers and factors influencing that performance, thanks to the Ho Chi Minh Academy uh, research um, and uh, discussions. And in 2013, 10 other provinces have hosted provincial level diagnostics workshops tailored to understand and analyze what are the strengths and the weaknesses of that particular province at the individual uh, level. In a short, PAPI is becoming a gold mine of data and research. Researchers not only from the Academy or the Fatherland Front, but also from the Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences, from different development organizations, from the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, they have been using the PAPI data 
to try to understand issues of governance and public administration in Vietnam. Now, let me give you very quickly a very quick overview of what are the main findings at the national level when we put all the 63 provinces together that give us a picture of governance and public administration in Vietnam. And then um, my colleague, uh, Dr. San from Secores, will talk about the specific uh, results at the provincial level. First, what we noted is that there seems to be marginal improvements in, in five of the six dimensions uh, of puppy, right? When we put together the mean scores at the dimension level uh, from one year to another one, we see that there is a constant um, uh, improvement, but very marginal and not statistically significant in the sense uh, of the word. And at a very low base, especially the issues of participation, transparency, and vertical um, accountability. Then, what we, when we looked at the distribution of provinces, we are trying to, to see whether uh, the changes occur at the high scoring provinces or at the low scoring provinces. And basically what this chart shows is the distribution of three provinces that distribute all other 63. The highest scoring province, the mid scoring province, and the low scoring provinces. We need to fix this uh, slide, please. Right? Um, we see that there are improvements in five dimensions for the highest scoring provinces. The only dimension that doesn't see an improvement from the highest scoring province is participation. We see that the median scores of participation are also reduced from 2012 to 2011 and from 2013 to 2011. That's important. Why? Because it splits the distribution of respondents in half. That's what the median province does. It splits the distribution of half. It basically means that 31 provinces are either up or above that uh, particular uh, score, scores. And then what we find is that lowest scores have also improved in five of the six dimensions. The only dimension that didn't see any improvements in the lowest scoring provinces is public administrative uh, procedures. But what does it all mean, you know, this improvement, these provinces, or these other provinces? What are the context? What are the issues that Vietnamese citizens are most concerned? Uh, and this is one additional question that we added this year and that we can hope that can give us some understanding of what are the drivers of that uh, satisfaction. We asked for the first time, what are the most serious issues uh, according to the Vietnamese citizens, the most serious socioeconomic issues? And what we found is that the issues of environmental pollution, traffic accidents, and drug abuse are the top three issues in the mind of the Vietnamese citizens. Uh, issues of food hygiene and safety is the fourth, and corruption. One in four Vietnamese citizens believe that corruption is one of the main socioeconomic issues um, in the country. But when we start disaggregating, and this is something that this year's uh, Puppy analysis tries to do is try to see what are those differences because it's not only enough you know, to aggregate all those different responses, but all, the, all those different groups, the vulnerable and uh, disadvantaged group. And that we find is that keen citizens are most concerned with issues of environmental issues, drug abuse, and food hygiene, and corruption than other ethnic minorities, for example. But when it comes to living cost, employment, and income, is non keen citizens, the, the other ethnic minorities that are most concerned with those uh, issues. So we have a differences of, of, of perceptions on what are the main socioeconomic issues according to the ca demographic characteristics of the respondents. Next, um, the environment, the, the economic environment in which all these responses is provided is also uh, important. We find again, as we did in the previous two years, that there is a great deal of optimism in the Vietnamese citizens. Eight in 10 citizens perceive their economic situation to be from normal to very good. But again, this is the ad, at the aggregate level. When we start disaggregating, when we start digging deeper into the analysis, we start noticing disparities in terms of these levels of satisfaction. Where are those disparities, for example? There is a 21% differences in the perception of equality in economic opportunities by ethnicity, for example, right? Eighty-four percent of Keynes believe their economic conditions to be from normal to very good, but only 
63% of other ethnic minorities. And when we talk about genders, the difference of perception when looking into the future also is uh, significant. 61% of men versus 51% of women think that their economic conditions in the future will be better. Then we start exploring that there are these differences of uh, perception, these differences of optim and that this economic optimism does not necessarily translate either in higher levels of satisfaction with governance and public administration at the performance level. For example, transparency and land issues, one of the issues that have been debated uh, in Vietnam for years, and we consistently uh, record in our respondents that there are barely any improvements in the publicity of land use plans from 2011 to 2013. Very clearly, eight in 10 Vietnamese citizens are still unaware of the land use plans in their locality, right? In 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013, right? In an extreme case, in the province that has the lowest levels of awareness, only nearly 2% of the respondents said that they knew what these land use plans were. But in the most positive case, it was nearly 50% of the population in that provinces who knew or have access to that uh, land use uh, plans. And again, of those informed, the majority seems to be coming from the local governments, and a very little, around 6%, comes from other uh, channels. And this has been consistent, and for this we have information since uh, 2010. Corruption is the other issue that remains um, a problem and still is a prevalent issue in the responses from ordinary Vietnamese uh, citizens. In 2013, citizens still largely agree with the statements that bribery are required at the public district hospitals, 42% to get a job in the public sector, 42% um, again. To get a land use right certificate, 30% of the respondents told uh, as that they had to pay some sort of phone B, some sort of informal payment, some sort of envelope. Uh, care at primary schools, 27%. Construction permits, lower at 24%. And diversion of state funds, 20%. But what is interesting to note here is that there was a big jump on these perceptions from 2011 to 2012. And from 2012 to 2013, it has stabilized at that high level. Right? It's not, it, it doesn't seem to continue to be growing. I think it's difficult for it to continue uh, uh, de deteriorating more, growing in that regard. But it has stabilized at that level for the past two years at that level of agreement with the perceptions that informal payments, corruption, and bribery still occur at the local level. But also, and this is here you know, a great, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, interesting levels of information, right? We also ask citizens how much do they believe that the provincial governments are really serious about dealing with corruption, right? And uh, you know, th this is in response to all the different government and party policies that have been issued to address this problem um, of corruption. And the citizens believe that the local officials are gradually becoming more serious about controlling corruption, somehow, right? And this is a positive trend, right? from 34% in 2011 to 38% in 2013, right? That Vietnamese citizens perceive that provincial level governments are becoming more serious at the perception level of the respondents. But still, one in four Vietnamese citizens perceive no serious effort, right? And this is very important you know, to highlight as well. One in four Vietnamese citizens perceive no serious efforts in addressing corruption, and nearly two in three just don't know whether they are serious or not, right, um, on those issues. And the perception increases with the knowledge of the anti-corruption law. And this is why this is very important, you know, to, 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 to disseminate uh, pieces of, uh, of, of legislation in a way that is easy to understand, easy to digest, and easy to apply to ordinary Vietnamese citizens. What we found is that citizens who said in one of the questions that they have heard or they have read the anti-corruption law, they have a higher level of um, perception on 
whether the provincial governments are serious with dealing with corruption. 48% versus 31% for those who have not read or those who are not aware of the anti-corruption law. But uh, Papi is way much more than corruption issues. And what we are trying also to identify is what are the drivers that influence quality of public services. And last year, we made the argument that Vietnam has moved from the stage of ac providing access to public services to a stage in which the quality becomes very important, according to its development trends. And what we have tried to do is try to understand to what extent public administrative services or the satisfaction to public administrative services is based on the actual experiences that Vietnamese citizens, um, when they interact in the one-stop shops, when they interact with the land use plans. Areas of concern in the quality of public services mainly relate then not to the access, not to the infrastructure, not to the hard software of administrative procedures, but to the soft skills, to the human interactions, the human relations of the public officials undertaking those administrative procedures. Why are we saying this? Well, basically because when we come to certification procedures, for example, when citizens perceive that they have a disrespectful treatment from um, the providers, their satisfaction levels diminish by 36%, for example. Right? And when the deadlines are not met, the satisfaction reduces by 32%. Right? Uh, so it's issues you know, uh, uh, that have to deal with, 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 with what happens inside the one-stop shops, what happens inside when the procedure is being provided, rather than the accessibility, the, the, the timeliness, or the, the, the ease of access to those services. The reduction in satisfaction is more dramatic with construction permits, for example. Right? What we found is that where there is disrespect to behavior, or where there is disrespect to behavior uh, noted from the respondents, satisfaction is lower by 78%. Right? So it's a dramatic right, uh, uh, drop in the levels of satisfaction. And when they perceive that there's some level of incompetence, uh, lack of knowledge, lack of skills, that the, the, the public official, uh, the conchuk, cannot provide you know, the information, then that satisfaction level drops by 51%. One in two for example, right, that will see their satisfaction dropped considerably. And that creates uh, resentment of the citizens with um, the public officials. For land use right applications, the biggest turn off in 2013, where again, disrespectful treatment, it reduces satisfaction by 69%, and interestingly, excessive paperwork, right, 50%. And here, you know, we have a differences in terms of what are the top three levels of uh, satisfaction levels with, when it comes to land use rights um, certificates. We do the same on public service delivery. We also have noted that there is a high level of access to public service, high level of access to public primary school, high level of access to public um, district hospital. And then we try to compare, you know, what are those drivers of satisfaction in these two main public services being provided uh, in Vietnam. And we do exactly the same, right? We are trying to identify what drives citizens to judge the quality of those services, right? When they have a relative that has been sick in the past year and they have to take him to the district hospital or a household that have children at the public primary school, we ask them about their actual experiences with the district hospital and with the uh, public primary school. Regarding primary schools, again, parent satisfaction in this case reduces by more than one quarter, 28%, when their children's teachers exhibit poor teaching performance. And this is all, all perception based, right? When parents perceive that their teachers that are meant to talk their children do not have you know, the enough qualifications uh, to teach uh, their kids. In the classroom, it's followed by demands for bribes and informal payments, 15%. Right? The issue of you know, informal payments for additional care um, after school uh, hours, and irregular feedback mechanisms. 
When it comes to drivers of satisfaction regarding public district hospitals, the experiences, again, are not necessarily about the accessibility to these health facilities or capital investments in infrastructure uh, and facilities. This respectfulness from the health practitioners erodes patient satisfaction levels by 51%, followed by irregular visits, nearly 44%, and followed by unreasonable um, expenses and informal payments. This is my last slide um, in my presentation. One of the issues that we try to do every year in Papi is that, to, to, uh, that is, first of all, provide a picture of how much has changed vis-a-vis -vis the previous year. But Papi has a wealth of data and a wealth of information that we also we are trying to, to dig deeper and try to explore. What this year, what we have decided was to look at what are the, what we call the equality of governance experiences, not only across provinces, but also within provinces. And this is what uh, Dr. Prativa Mehta was mentioned um, earlier in her uh, remarks. What we are trying to understand is uh, whether there, there exist differences within provinces or not according to the individual characteristics of the respondents, more than the traditional discussion of differences across or between provinces. And this is exactly what we find, right? That citizens' experiences on governance are very differently even with the borders of a district, not only a province, even with the borders of the same district. 70% of the differences in those experiences is accounted for individual level characteristics, whether the respondent is a male or a female, a kin or non or other ethnic minorities, um, it's um, levels of occupations or the, the, the levels of education that that person has. And what we found is that men experience substantially better governance than women, overall. Right? When we start looking deeper, you know, overall, when we looked at all the responses, you know, women seem to be less satisfied with governance, with public service pr uh, 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 provision, with public administrative uh, procedures. The Keen report also better governance than other ethnic minorities. Right? And the wealthy and professional experiences greater satisfaction than the poorer, the micro entrepreneurs, and the manual laborers across all 63 provinces. How do we know that? You know, that graph shows the typology of provinces that we have uh, identified. Um, the bigger the shape of uh, the highest the, the inequalities of that experience, right? We see a bunch of provinces grouped that they have, you know, very similar experiences. We have no problems in that provinces, but there seems to be some, a group of provinces that have the largest variation in those uh, respondents. And Quang Ngai is uh, one of them. Uh, in conclusion, what we are finding is that while some citizens experiences an elite service of efficiency, others rank their, experience, their experiences as extremely poor. Why is this important? Right? This is important because now, as Vietnam becomes a middle-income country, right? Um, no one should be left behind, and leaving people behind will create more dissatisfaction and will uh, 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 make it more difficult to, to uh, bypass the barriers to human development for a significant number of uh, Vietnamese uh, citizens. 